words of hope and of comfort. The gospel is good news. And as we come to our text, Revelation chapter 12, 1 to 6, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ lifts us up high above all the noise and the chaos and the fray to see the big picture from heaven's point of view. And when we see it from heaven's point of view, we see that it's all good. It's all under control. What's God telling us this morning? He's saying, my child, don't be worried, don't be afraid. I've got this. Now, we're coming to Revelation chapter 12. We're just jumping right into the middle of the book. So I want to just give you a few details about the book and my approach to it. It's commonly, I'm following the commonly accepted view of the last 2,000 years in the church that this is a late date that the book was written by the Apostle John, probably in the, around the year 95 or 96. So I, I don't, I'm not going to be preaching this text from a preterist position, which holds that most of the things in the book were written and predicted about the year 70. And as we come to the book, we, we need to understand that the, the book is basically seven cycles, and seven cycles that go from the beginning of the world to the end, the whole history of the world till the final judgment. It cycles through that seven times, but every cycle kind of spirals up. It gets higher and broader, and it increases in intensity. So we begin in the first chapters with the first cycle. That's the, the, the letters to the seven churches. And it deals with them here on earth, and their struggles, and their tribulation, their problems. But the, the, the next cycle and the following cycles go up and up until finally at the end, in the last cycle, we come to the last chapter, and we're in the new heavens, in the new earth, and in eternity. And so chapters 1 through 11 is the first part of the book, the first three cycles, starting here on earth. But as we come to chapter 12 and we enter the, the fourth cycle, we're, we're being lifted up higher and higher, and we're starting to see things more and more from the view from heaven. There's a focus here on spiritual realities. There is a cosmic and a universal perspective about the history of the world. This is a cosmic view of the struggle and the war between Christ and his enemies. Now, Revelation is known as the Apocalypse, and the Apocalypse means revelation of hidden truths. And, and, and the Lord does this, the Holy Spirit does this, using symbols and visions. He's painting a picture. He, he's not giving us revelation so that we can take each word, each detail, and draw a line to a specific date or event or person in history but he's painting kind of a, a dreamlike vision, and we have to kind of get the main idea. We can't take it literally, every little detail, because it's not supposed to be taken literally, just like the parables of our Lord are not supposed to be taken literally. There's different genres in the Scripture, and apocalyptic uh, revelation is one of them. And so just an example, in Revelation chapter 20, it speaks about Satan being bound with a chain. Well, you can't take that literally because Satan is spirit. He doesn't have a physical body like ours. There's no chain that exists that can chain a spirit. And so these are pictures, and God is teaching us through these pictures. And so God is giving us in our text a heavenly perspective to help us discern the times we're living in. And I'm going to begin in verse 1 here. A great sign appeared in heaven. John is having a vision. He sees a sign, and a sign is, a, again, a representation. It's not the literal thing. It's a representation. The picture, the sign is in heaven because what the Holy Spirit's telling us is this is God's authoritative perspective. This is happening in the spiritual realm. And this is important, brothers and sisters. God's reminding us that you need to see things from various perspectives. Uh, you, many of you have probably seen that, that uh, illusion of which, which, when you look at it one way, it looks like an ugly old crone, and then you flip it upside down, or maybe the right way up, who knows, and suddenly it's a beautiful young woman. 
And, and it's the same picture. So it depends on how you look at things. So we look at things here below, and it looks like everything's a big mess. And sometimes we may think, is there any hope? But God lifts us up this morning to look the right way from his perspective. And what do we see? Well, we see a beautiful young woman, don't we? She's a beautiful woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet. This is the church of God. This is the royal daughter of God. This is the bride of Christ. This is the one of whom it is sung in the scriptures in Song of Songs chapter 6. Who is this? who looks down like the dawn, beautiful as the moon, bright as the sun, awesome as an army with banners, the royal, beautiful bride of Christ. Psalm 45, 13 says this, all glorious is the princess in her chamber with robes interwoven with gold. This royal bride is clothed with the sun. She's clothed with the sun. Now, we just went through an eclipse, well, a partial one here, but a full one over in Ontario, I think. And, and we all know that, that the sun is incredibly powerful. You, you can't look at it when it's shining. You can't look at it because it's too much. And, and the woman is clothed with that kind of glory. It reminds us of Revelation chapter 1, where Christ our Lord is described as shining with the brightness of the sun. It reminds us of, of the Mount of Transfiguration when the Lord Jesus was revealed in all his glory to the disciples with dressed in blindingly pure light. And so what God is describing here is the church robed and dressed in the righteousness, the holiness, and the glory of the Lord Jesus. And she has the moon under her feet, which, which indicates to us that she is sovereign. She rules. She has dominion, the dominion for which she was created, the dominion she was created to have over the entire earth. And she has a crown of 12 stars. And 12, of course, in the Scriptures, you think of the 12 patriarchs, the 12 tribes, the 12 apostles. This is the fullness of God's people, the holy Catholic Church, which from the beginning to the end of the world, the Lord Jesus gathers, defends, and preserves by His Word and Spirit. This is the church Catholic, and she is crowned with heavenly glory and with the light of the revelation of God. This is the woman that the God had told us about in Genesis 3, 15. This is the holy woman between whose holy seed the Lord put enmity with the seed of the serpent. This is the woman, victorious in her holy seed, victorious in the Christ. And this royal, glorious queen is you. It's us. It's the church. Not as seen by the world, as weak and shameful and despised and broken and as nothing, but the church as God sees you, resplendent with the glory of Christ. And she is pregnant, verse 2. She's pregnant and she's crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. The Holy Spirit really emphasizes it here. He, he repeats, crying out in birth pains, the agony of giving birth. And, and we reminded the Old Testament period when the church was pregnant with expectation of the coming Messiah and how that was not an easy thing because the church suffered all kinds of trials and wars, famines, exiles, occupations by foreign armies, massacres, journeys, all the time that holy line of the Messiah hanging by a thread. There was so much suffering that the church in the Old Testament went through to get to the Christ. Those are the birth pains 
That's the agony of giving birth. God gives us great and glorious blessings in the Lord Jesus. But it is through much affliction, it is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't come easy. Verse 3, another sign appeared in heaven. So it's, it's a representation and it's a spiritual reality that God is describing for us here. And here's this red dragon. Now we know from verse 9 that this is Satan, that ancient serpent. He is red, the color of, of blood and death and danger. He has seven heads. He's, that's the fullness of cunning. And he has ten horns. And ten of, in the scriptures of also often it, it, it signifies fullness. He has ten horns, a, a fullness of power. The horn in Scripture represents power. He's got a lot of smarts, a lot of cunning, and a lot of power. And he's got seven diadems on his head. And that tells us something. That tells us that he's got power and he uses it. But the main focus, the main focus of our enemy is cunning and deception and leading astray. We often get distracted by the brute force power that he levies or leverages against the church. But the more dangerous thing is the deception, the lies, the leading astray. You remember that the scripture warns us that the, the devil can represent himself to us as an angel of light. He's a real clever deceiver. And his tail, verse 4, swept down one-third of the stars of heaven. Now, Job chapter 38 tells us that the, or it, it, it reveals to us that the, the, the angels are, are called stars. The, the morning stars sang for joy when God made the creation, when he finished the creation. In Revelation chapter 1, uh, the Lord is represented as, as holding stars in his hand, and he, he tells John what they mean. He says, well, the seven stars are the seven angels of the seven churches. And, and angel, of course, is not just the spiritual beings who are ministering spirits that's sent forth by God, but the word angel simply just means messenger. And so when Jesus in chapter 1 says the seven angels of the seven churches, he's speaking about the preachers, the people that are bringing the message of God. And so here the, the stars represent the spiritual angels, not the, not, the, not the physical ones. And he swept a third of the stars down to the earth. That signifies that in the fall of Satan, there was a great fall. And it looks like a huge number of angels fell with him who are not angels anymore, but demons. And if you look at the book of Jude, the letter of Jude, he speaks about the angels as wandering stars, stars that did not keep to their place. Now, this mighty enemy stands before the woman to devour the child that is about to be born. And that really is the summing up of the entire Old Testament, ever since Genesis chapter 3, that the devil has wanted to kill the Christ. It happened immediately in the next generation after the fall as Cain killed his brother Abel. And it goes on from there as the devil incites violence and bloodshed from generation to generation, from century to century, trying to destroy the holy line of the Messiah, trying to prevent the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we read through the Old Testament, and that's, that's what's behind all the struggles. That's what's behind all the violence. That's what's behind everything, all the conflict, is that the devil doesn't want Jesus to be born. Because if Jesus is not born, he can't die for our sins. He can't save us. We are lost forever. That's the story of the Old Testament. That's what it's telling us. That's what it's reminding us. And you think of, of Isaac and, and Ishmael. You think of, of Moses and Pharaoh trying to kill him and kill all the babies, all the male babies in the nation of Israel. You think of the attempts to kill David. You think of the time when the queen mother, Athaliah, killed her, the entire royal family, killed her own grandkids. And only Joash escaped. 
So many times in the history of God's people, that holy line which leads to the Messiah was hanging by a thread. And when we get to the Lord Jesus and his birth, Herod comes in and kills all the kids in Bethlehem. That's what's happening. The dragon is wanting to devour the child who is to be born, and he thinks that he finally did it when Christ is nailed to the cross. Now I have won. I have destroyed my enemy. That's what the devil's thinking. But he's wrong. Praise God, he's wrong. Verse 5, she gave birth to, birth to a male child, one who's to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. We sang about him in Psalm 2. All the ancient prophecies come true because when God promises, he keeps his promises, every one of them. That a virgin shall conceive, that Emmanuel will be born, Emmanuel, God with us, <clears throat> and that he will rule all the nations with a rod of iron. This is the Son of God himself who is born. And the devil can't get him. The, ca the devil can't destroy him. But her child was caught up to God and to his throne. That's the ascension. Not this Thursday, but next Thursday is Ascension Day. That's what the church is remembering around the world, that Christ was caught up to God and his throne. God wins. Christ is victorious. There is no counsel, there is no wisdom which can prevail against the Lord. The devil thought he had the final victory in Jesus' death on the cross, but through the resurrection and the ascension, God shows us our Savior reigning in glory and untouchable. And so verse 6, the woman fled into the wilderness. Now, freedom, as I've already said, doesn't come without a struggle. The people of Israel in the Old Testament, they got free from Egypt, but then they had to trudge through the wilderness and go through all kinds of trials and afflictions on the way to the promised land. And when God tells us that the New Testament church after the ascension flees into the wilderness, he's, he's, giving, he's sending us a message here, brothers and sisters. What's he telling us? He says, well, Jesus has taken you out of the Egypt of sin. But now you need to trudge through the wilderness of this fallen world to get to the new heavens and the new earth. And we know that, right? Because that's what life often is, a lot of trudging. It doesn't always go well. There's a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties. And so we have this already not yet we have this already that Christ is enthroned in the heavens and that we are seated in the heavenly places in glory with him and in him. We have the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ in his resurrection and his ascension. But at the same time, we're still waiting for the fullness, the consummation of all things. We've still got a journey ahead of us. But we're not in a room. You see what the Holy Spirit tells us? She fled into the wilderness, not to wander around trying to figure things out on her own, where she has a place prepared by God. God takes care of his church. God provides a place of safety and refuge and protection and provision. As God gave manna from heaven in the Old Testament, so God sustains and nourishes his church today with bread from heaven as he feeds us with the holy gospel in the preaching and in the sacraments. And then if you look at the last line there in verse 6, in which she is to be nourished, which is a fine translation. The Greek's a little weird here because it, it, it says where they nourish her, where they nourish her. By weird, I mean it's a little unexpected. They nourish her. Who's they? And so the translation often just uh, smooths over things which are a little bit difficult to, to, to grasp, and, and this is a fine translation we have, but, but it's really they nourish her. Well, who's the they? It's, it's the the people that God sends, 
to speak the gospel, to teach the gospel. We are sustained with bread from heaven. The church lives not by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. The church is sustained by the preaching of the gospel, which is why on every Lord's Day, we stop what we're doing, and we spend roughly an hour in the morning and another hour in the afternoon being fed, because that's what gives us the strength to carry on. Now, this happens for 1,260 days, which is 42 months or three and a half years, and that comes back a bunch of times in the Old Testament in Daniel and here in Revelation. What's it mean? Well, you think of the time of Elijah, when for three and a half years there was a, a famine, there was no rain. You remember Elijah, I'm the only one. The church seems to have disappeared. Everything's fallen apart. God, like what happened to your plans? Seriously, the, the church is not to be seen. And then God says, Elijah, look, I've preserved 7,000 who have not bowed the knee. You may not see it, but I've got the church in my care and under my protection. And so the three and a half years is a time of, of suffering. It's a time of purification. It's a time of waiting. It's a time when sometimes, as we confess in the Belgian Confession, sometimes you can't even see the church in some places in the world. But God has his people. But it's three and a half years, which is half of seven. Seven is the number of fullness. It's nowhere near a fullness of time. It's cut short. It won't go on forever. And that three and a half years in Revelation describes the period between the ascension of our Lord and his return. Now, we've gone through the text, and I want to leave a few applications with you as I finish the sermon. And the first one is this, that the battle has begun. It started back in Genesis 3.15. God said there's enmity, there's warfare, there's a cosmic clash between darkness and light. There's a war going on. And, and you've got to know that. If you're living in the middle of a war and you don't know there's a war, you're going to get very confused and you're going to have a lot of problems. I mean, if you're living in a little village on the front lines between Ukraine and Russia right now and you, and you don't know there's a war, you're going to be really surprised when you, when you go out in the morning and there's things flying around and buildings are destroyed. You won't understand that. You've got to know what's going on. There are a lot of Christians, brothers and sisters, that live as though we're not in a war. And then they don't understand why life hurts so often. Do you know that we're at war? That we're in that state of war that has existed ever since the fall, and that total peace will only cover the earth when the Lord Jesus Christ returns? Brothers and sisters, so often I minister to Christians who are suffering and they're surprised. Why? Why is my happy life, my comfortable life, suddenly there's this intrusion of pain? Why? Why is this happening? And the Bible warns us not to be surprised. Peter says in 1 Peter 4, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. The way to glory is through the cross, brothers and sisters. Jesus says, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross. That's an instrument of pain, of suffering, of torture, of dying. Take that cross up and walk the way I walked, through the valley of the shadow of death to the glory of the new heavens and the new earth. Don't be surprised. It's, it's the way things are. 1 John 3, 13, do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you because we're at war. And to those who love sin and hate Christ, you look like the enemy. So the battle has begun, but then the second application I want to leave with you is that the battle has been won. And that's especially worked out in the rest of the chapter. But the battle has been won. That's what we're going to celebrate in Ascension Day that's coming up. Our Savior came. He was born. He suffered. He died. He rose. He conquered sin and death. He ascended to rule in glory. 
And if you sum up the message of Revelation, it's this. God wins. Jesus wins. What does God tell us as we we suffer? He says this. He says, greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. The devil is a loser. And we, says the scripture, are more than conquerors. And the devil didn't win the first round from the Old Testament beginning to the, to the coming of our Lord Jesus. And he certainly will not win round two. Now, how do, we, how do we experience being more than conquerors, brothers and sisters? Well, we win the way Jesus won. We win by losing. We live by dying. That's the way of the cross. And then the scripture reminds us in, the, in our text that we are back in the wilderness. The Old Testament church was waiting for the promised land. They were trudging through the desert. They were longing for the promised land. And, and then they were also longing long-term for the coming of the Messiah. And here we are again in the wilderness. But this time it's bigger. It's more cosmic. It's a spiritual reality. Because the New Testament church awaits the new heavens and the new earth in which righteousness dwell. We are those who the Scripture describes as those who long for His appearing. And the church is pregnant with expectation. Pregnant with expectation of the parousia, the return of our Lord. And like the Old Testament church was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth, the New Testament church, brothers and sisters, is experienced the birth pangs of a new world. It is through much tribulation that we enter the kingdom of God. What does Paul say to the church? He says, I'm suffering with labor pains, with the pains of giving birth, until Christ is formed in you. It's a painful process giving birth, and the mothers here know that very well. And as the, a new world is born, it comes through a lot of pain and a lot of suffering. Now, our Lord Jesus told us about that, Mark 13, 8, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are about the beginning of birth pains. That's exciting. We don't like the pain, but we like what's coming after the pain. Romans chapter 8, 22, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for adoption as sons for the redemption of our bodies. The creation can't wait to be made whole. The creation can't wait to hear Jesus say, behold, I have made all things new. The creation waits with eager longing the day that we are revealed as sons of God with our glorified bodies in a perfect world. Because on that day, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption. And so there's this pregnant expectation in the world and the creation around us and in all the children of God that something better is coming. Every day, we're one day closer But it comes through pain. It comes through the birth pangs. Why does life hurt so much? Why do things go wrong? Why is there suffering? Why is there hurt, pain, brokenness? Why are there so many scary things in the world and in my life? Brothers and sisters, if we don't have the context, if we don't have the big picture that God is showing us this morning, then we're going to despair. Think about a woman, and this is a really strange example, I know. But think about a woman who is nine months pregnant. She's about to give birth. The the contractions are starting, and she doesn't know. I have no idea how or not, but but she she doesn't know she's pregnant. And so she wants to sit down with a nice book and a cup of coffee, but ah, there's this massive pain. What's going on? That's scary. She wants to go for a nice walk in the sunshine with her husband. Wants to go out for a nice dinner. 
why is this? What's going on? Why can't I enjoy myself? Why is my body just racked with all these pains? What is going on? That's terrifying. If you don't know, it's terrifying. But if she knows, if she knows, and those, those pains of childbirth begin, she doesn't like the pain but she likes what's coming. She knows that something good is coming. She understands the context. Do we, do we, brothers and sisters, do we understand the big picture? Do we understand the times? The battle has begun. Cosmic conflict rages through all of history. All of history proclaims the victory of our Lord Jesus Christ, that He will win the battle. And so we wait in the wilderness, and we wait on the Lord, and we take refuge in God, our mighty fortress. And though this world, with devils filled, should threaten to undo us, we will not fear, for God has willed His truth to triumph through us. That word above all earthly powers, that word nourishes and sustains us to eternal life. The time in the wilderness is short, but eternity is long. Let go. Let go of what you cannot keep. Take hold of what you cannot lose. Let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill, God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Amen.